Layman, great to finally meet in person. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I enjoyed talking with you over the years, but there's something special about being in person. Yeah, so you've been on the channel a couple of times, mainly talking about Integral. And, but what we're going to talk about now is maybe, and there's a kind of, there's a coherence to the conversation that we've been hosting on Rebel Wisdom. There's kind of the galaxy brain tendency of the kind of systematizers, um, the kind of idea of developmental thinking. There's, there's, there's kind of a, a there there in terms of the conversation and maybe as we're kind of getting towards the end of wrapping up Rebel Wisdom, one of the questions is like, what is that conversation? Where is that conversation at? And what is that conversation missing? And I know that you've got, um, yeah, you've got a kind of perspective on some of the qualities that you think maybe need to come more into the conversation. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways we could go with that. There are several missing chunks, but one of them I think of as the, the subconscious turn. And I think that a lot of our, a lot of stuff we call the galaxy brain is not just um, the exaggerated logical tactical planners, how are we going to solve the meta crisis problem, but it's an over reliance on consciousness. And even in an integral sense, right, you got to assume that most of, if, if we take something like developmental stages seriously, those aren't developmental stages of the front part of the brain that does the waking, knowing, and talking. Right? It's the developmental stages of the whole being, which is primarily a subconscious intelligence and might need to be tapped and activated and encouraged in ways that aren't conversation and witnessing exercises, but are ritualistic, tribalistic, artistic, and to some degree psychoanalytic. So there's a term that I think, um, you know, people like Alexander Barr are also holding space for, which is we have to go deeper into the dark affects, we have to go deeper into the tribalism, we've got to return to a certain kind of magic. I think there's a real potency to the role of the occult in these spaces, not only because the occult played such a role in the tribal formation period of humanity's ancestry that we need to come back to, but also because the esoteric lineages, particularly in the West, have been, whether they've been succeeding or not, they've been trying to do the very thing that people like John Vervake here are pointing to. Right? Can we set up an intergenerational religion that's not a religion that pursues Illuminism in a scientific manner and is able to adapt to different cultural circumstances? Well, people have been working on that for centuries. There are lineages. Uh, we should learn from their mistakes, but also lean into trying to do what they were trying to do. And can you give some examples of that? What do you think are the specifics that you would like to see more made of? I would like to see, um, first of all, events like this. Uh, I would like to see them have more ordeal-like rituals, uh, not so much endless conversation. I would like to see the sharing be oriented toward things that come out of people that they don't understand. Right? So rather than gathering around and saying, hey, tell us who you are and what you read and why you're interested in this comrades, and then let's think together about who we are and what this might become. Why don't you tell me something that you don't know why you're telling me that. <laughs> Tell me something that makes no sense to you. Let's get a conversation going between other parts of ourselves because those parts are smarter. They're evolutionarily attuned to be part of the tribal formation. They give us insight into what's emerging uh, and they can just go to so many more places than this little narrow front beam of consciousness can go. Yeah. And th there's something about the the occult practices that is obviously intrinsic to consciousness. It's kind of a, it's an exploration into consciousness. And I've always kind of seen it as an exploration, like the, the magical um, dimension is about intention. It's consciousness and intention. And there's some kind of connection between the two that, that seems really important to kind of bring back into the conversation. Yeah, intentionality is key. I think we've exaggerated the degree to which the notion of awareness itself is the primary instrument for the cultivation of metacognitive faculties, right? And we're setting up a community that is somehow a social analogy to metacognition, and it requires individuals to have more complete embodied metacognitive capacity. How do you get that? The standard answer from the 20th century has been you just watch everything that's arising, right? You allow the subject to become the object of its own observation. That's great. But what I would say is the reason that works is because of the intention to do something different with your attention and not because of the witnessing. 
The witnessing is one exercise, and there are many exercises, and they all start with intentional modification of your attention. I think all inner practices work in that way, and that the buildup of intention not only makes you more competent in the world, but it's the very thing that cultivates metacognitive capacity. I mean, this resonates for me partly because one of, one of the frames that we've talked about in Rebel Wisdom is that we're in post-secular times, and I think that means kind of the return to sort of religion, the return to kind of other forms of knowing, um, and particularly the sort of religious religious dimension coming back into the world in a really unpredictable, and I would say like the, we're back in a time of magic in some ways. I had a really fascinating conversation uh, with Gary Lackman about the Trump election and all of those kind of crazy synchronicities around Pepe the Frog as a sigil, the kind of link to the Egyptian kind of frog god, Keck, and all of those, like, there's definitely something there in terms of Trump's election as almost like a magical spell created by a sort of group consciousness of intentionality by a lot of the the, the kind of meme boys and, and all the, the rest of it playing with this, this yeah, th this kind of dimension of reality. So if you believe that, and I'm highly persuaded by it um, personally, then you've got to know that this, these things are already part of the, yeah. the world. We can be agnostic about what the ontology of these things really are, right? Are we talking about metaphors? Are we talking about real things? We don't actually have to decide about that so much. There are processes here that seem to work, and there are ancient forms of human intelligence designed to deal with those processes and roles for individuals, right? So one of the things that shamans used to do was keep an eye on the collective unconscious <laughs> because it's determining a lot of things. And as much as we have a fantastic conscious discursive map, um, we need to understand where the unconscious comes into all of that, how we modulate it, who should modulate it. Otherwise, we're going to be in the same position as political pundits in the 2016 election, totally caught off guard by something that seems irrational, and yet it happened anyway, right? That's the playing field. That's the situation the world's in. It's an uncanny, non-rational process for the most part. Uh, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> it's risky, it's exciting, uh, we have to dare to play that way, some of us won't want to, but uh, there's a skill set there we need to encourage, and I think that one of the reasons that is coming back into play is just the sense that none of the reasonable options have been working, right? Seemingly reasonable people have been in charge for a while, our problems are accelerating, what else you got? <laughs> And another example that just came to mind was Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion, we're actually playing very deliberately with sigils. Um, I'll maybe bring it up on screen now, but the, the famous kind of hourglass sigil that they used uh, was, I think, a Nordic rune for meaning Kairos or the moment, it's kind of seizing the moment. May have got that slightly wrong, but it was definitely a Nordic, a Nordic rune. And there was sort of very deliberately kind of meme magic being, being played. Um, Maybe let's kind of expand that for people who might be skeptical. Like the idea of a sigil or of, of a magical symbol is something that you place your attention on. In a way, it's kind of irrelevant in some ways what it is, but it's just a, a focal point that enough people can focus on and then that intentionality itself can have a, an impact on, on reality. And you can even think of like... Um, secular rational ways why that would be true if you are if, if enough people are focusing on that it may alter their behavior in a way so you can kind of you can deconstruct it rationalize it that way but you could also say that there's some formative effect that consciousness has on the world that is um and the world i mean i i'm totally bought into the idea that consciousness is fundamental and that the world is in some ways weirder than we can possibly imagine um i'm much more kind of in the stan groff um school of transpersonal psychology and if we think we understand what we are and what the world is then that's a level of arrogance that is unlikely to see us um, to work for us in the long run. I keep a healthy skepticism about all these things. Uh, but you like sure? you're saying, possibly. <laughs> and in fact the, the stuff we work on with the metaphysics of adjacency should tell us that you never have absolutes like zero and hundred percent that's not on the table. It's always a not quite. <laughs> uh, but there are definitely 
very transrational ways to discuss this, which don't accept or deny any particular uh, set of how we can, you know, formatively, morphologically, with some mysterious resonance, with some mysterious quantum effect. We don't need to think in those ways, although they may or may not turn out to be the case. We can definitely think about how it affects human beings. And part of it is it's a coordinating effect. Right? My notion of how religions emerge is very tied to the production of a shared numinous excess coherence that's based on increased coordination and collaboration between different types of people and different genres of social activity. So that gives us an extra potency. There's also the effect that symbols have on the individual. And a lot of that effect is um, not just to make them resonate with whatever the aesthetics or the associative meaning of the symbol are, but to actually turn on the subconscious as if it was the active entity. Make it start doing some exercise. Make it a player in the game. And then you don't know what it's going to figure out how to do, but you do know that it's, at the very least, a significant operative within yourself if you let it be, and possibly smarter than you. And what, what do you think that looks like in terms of bringing in more of these dimensions? Well, I mentioned ritual. I mentioned calling each other to say things that don't make any sense. Um, you know, I've been watching, when I came down here for this conference, I very deliberately thought I'm going to focus on somatic subtle energy sensing for the most part. I'm not going to worry too much about the analytic exchange. And I've been watching people propose things about how to create intersubjective blending and wee spaces and trying things out. And I've been trying to feel into it and watch for the moments where it actually works. The other day, the first you find day, any? Well, yeah, I was at Joe Lightfoot's circle. He and I actually had worked out the previous evening what he was going to say, and so he said that, and I didn't have to say anything. And so I was just watching the instructions of the group, and it was okay. There was a field of energy. We were getting to know each other, but there was a moment when I felt my heart lock melt and the energy came up a notch. And I was like, what just happened there? And in hindsight, what it looked like happened was Joe suddenly started talking about something that wasn't the theme he was discussing. And he suddenly asked a guy to comment on this topic. And there was no reason to think that guy had a comment on it. And that guy kind of twitched and then said something that seemed off topic. And there was a kind of cascading effect. And I thought, we're signaling each other from a place we don't understand right now. Right, so right now, these subconscious intelligences are also generating a wee space in addition to the conscious intelligences. Right, even that kind of, like, what did I do that for? And what could it possibly mean? I don't know. But it may have sent a message from something in me to something in you. <laughs> yeah. And what are the practices you think that need to be more introduced? Well, they're all over the place. There's all kinds of different kinds of things, right? I think... Uh, working with nature, natural energies, natural intelligences, immersion in the elemental conditions, which is where our ancestors drew their sense of magic from, uh, especially contemplating natural complexity, which is something you can't summarize for yourself. You just have to behold it. It's, it's a set of patterns that's too much for you. How do you work with that? Uh, improvisational skill is important. Uh, the contemplation of sigils and symbols and things where you it feels meaningful and you don't know why it's meaningful. Artistic processes, all the kinds of things the surrealists were doing. How do you draw stuff out of your dreams? How do you use chance and randomness to get outside of your predictions? Uh, for me, there are some other kinds of practices that I derive in connection with the Gurdjieffian lineages that I'm very focused on. Right, what what I, lineages, sorry? Uh, Gurdjieff. Oh, Gurdjieff, yeah. 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 Um, there's a lot of emphasis in his work on receiving perceptions differently. Right? And there's a lot of emphasis on taking a perception that's coming in through your senses and your consciousness and trying to digest it by connecting it to some other part of yourself. So this has turned out over the last few years to be one of my favorite practices. It's related, you know, uh, Eugene Genlin's work on focusing? Yeah. Right? So you're going to, he's coming up with a word, trying to feel if it matches the psychological concern. And you're kind of weighing them and looking for a match. So you could do that with perceptions. Right? If I find a novel perception, I'm like, oh, that's a very curious bug. So now I've got a novel perception. And now I'm going to be like, why? And I'm trying to think of a thing that matches it in feeling, but makes no sense to me. So I'm like, oh, it's lovely. I'm like, no, that makes sense. You start throwing things away and you're like, 
Toblerone chocolate bars. I'm like, makes no sense to me at all, but there's a felt match. And it's like I transmitted some of the energy and information, some of the stimulation of the perception to another part of me. It's locked in. It's received it. And if I do this a few times, then a couple minutes later, what builds up is an all-over sense of myself that is as powerful as anything I get from any of my other practices. So uh, that's really delicious for me, but it's also a way of, of making your subconscious, making your non-rational intelligence be a player in the game. Mm. And you've got um, how many podcasts now? Well, the Integral Stage podcast is divided into a number of different series. It's a, it's a Cthulhu with many tentacles. <laughs> um, so we've got the, the sex one, the psychoanalysis one, the author series. Uh, Bruce wants to start one on dreams, which I think is a really good idea. Um, you know, it's just lots of different kinds. You can find them all under the integral stage, but they're all, we're trying to make them thematic because the people interested in one set of information are not necessarily interested in the other. If you come in and you want to know about Greg Henrique's psychoanalytic theories, or psychotherapeutic theories, I should say, you don't necessarily want to hear about spiritual transmission or tantric sex. You might, or you might not. So it's kind of tidied up for people. And do you want to talk about what you've learned doing those and maybe point people towards some of your favorite episodes? It's very hard for me to think of favorite episodes. Um, I have a few least favorites, but in general, each one is so different. I have such fun just uh, getting into it with somebody. Um, what I've learned is a, most importantly, is a visceral sense of the richness of the topology of the whole landscape. And one of the things we deliberately set out to do was to be, take some risks uh, and also to not focus on, uh, just big name author, presenter, lecturers, right? That's the temptation when you're doing it. Uh, and as much as I love Steve McIntosh, how many times can you interview Steve McIntosh about his new book? I also want to hear about somebody who just is at home and loves metamodernism or right, like everybody in the field or somebody who's been ejected from a bunch of game B groups. That's very interesting too. Like what are all the types of people and all the types of pe thinking that's making one of the extended liminal web? Right? We don't know. I think one of the things that's gone on here that's difficult, right? I, I co-facilitated this session that Bjorkman was very interested in, in mapping and naming the field. And one of the things I was trying to bring up there is, do we have enough experience of what the field is to be able to map and name it? Right? There's different modes. So Joe Lightfoot was pointing out like how we can take the feeling of the shared intersubjective field more seriously. But what I wanted to say was, well, have we asked it what its name is, right? What if we switch into a second person mode? What if we switch into a number of different kinds of modes? So it's the same kind of thing with the integral stage. If we can have a much broader, take the risk of having a much wider sense of who all the people are and all the things they want to bring up, even if it bothers us sometimes, because we talk to people who bother other people, <laughs> um, then we'd be in a position to start to name it. But before then, if you're just going to the conference and talking to the right people, you're, it's too limited a sample size to even know what this event is. And you've talked about mapping the space, um, the field, and there's various names. The Liminal Web article, I think, by Joe Lightfoot was probably the, the best yeah. way of kind of identifying. There is a, let's put it this way, there is a there there. Mm -hmm. There's enough of a there there for people to know what we're talking about when we start kind of talking about the the conversation or um, where would you, how would you characterize it and where would you sort of um, not necessarily draw the boundaries, but how would you identify the, the and how, how would you describe the space? Yeah, I love Joe's term because it saves me time. I don't have to always go, well, you know, integral and metamodern and game B and Bildung and, and also for Vakey's people and all, you know. Uh, so liminal covers all that. I, I made a map coming in for thinking about this, and Bjorkman threw it up on the slide, but he covered the central section, and what I had named it was x.liminal.web, because x is unknown, because x is former, we're always moving on from the terms we come up with for ourselves, but also x because it's extended. It's not just the people in the podcast space or the conference space, it's all of whatever we're doing. And the reason liminality is a great word for that is the same reason I put so much focus on the metaphysics of adjacency. It's this notion of this in-betweenness and whether it's trying to work on subjective in-betweenness of sharing or it's trying to work on make greater harmony between the parts of the individual 
or whether you're looking at building a new cosmology that's connection and relationship oriented, there's all these notions of interconnectivity and betweenness and thresholds. And when you, you get a sense that these are people who in their ability to think orient towards some version of that and are able to emotionally make peace with that because those can be strange and disturbing spaces. And if you learn that you can inhabit some version of a liminal space uh, and get comfortable with that, then suddenly you've crossed a threshold and you're one of these people. And there are lots of people doing that who aren't in this direct web yet. You can see it all over. So on that map, I said, well, there's people who are doing uh, leading edge transdisciplinary science. Great. There's also people doing shamanic and you know, Tibetan Buddhist exploration of bardo states as the center of their probably oh, halfway things. Right? There's a lot of um, integrative health practitioners who not only are like, how do all these different modalities work together? But very often they're, how do the hemispheres of the brain work? How do the bits of the spine line up? They're very focused on these interstitial zones as the structural heart of where they think the action is and where the energy comes from. That's my sense of what they all have in common is, is that kind of structural analysis on the in-between and the emotional capacity to not be put off by that. And when, when you get that shift, then you start to sense there's a real power, there's a potential downstream of starting to focus on the next twos and the in-betweens. I guess to make it a little bit more personal for me and connecting to that sort of idea of liminality, Rebel Wisdom obviously played some role in mapping, cohering this conversation to some degree, featuring many of the people. And um, as you know, Rebel Wisdom is going to be wrapping up at the end of the year. And that, for me, was a very liminal experience of actually dropping in. I was feeling a little bit creatively kind of stuck. And I went to India and I did a lot of breath work with a with an amazing facilitator that I know. And breath work is kind of one of my main practices to, to tap into what I would call liminality or um, whatever the, the vertical is, whatever sure. the vertical is. And it really dropped in that it was it was time to let go of this particular incarnation of, of this journey, that rebellion wasn't appropriate, and that and I'm sort of feeling into that. It's it's still a very um, uncomfortable place because it does feel like a kind of death process in a way of giving up something that's been so core to my identity for the last four or five years. Um, and I can't say that I haven't had sort of back and forth moments of like, really, is this? And some people telling me that it's a really terrible idea to, yeah. to, to stop it. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in maybe if you've got any reflections on that process and thoughts on maybe the, the, the role of rebel wisdom and where you think that this may be going and any advice for me? Um, yeah, interesting Layman. question. I won't say that everybody's loved Rebel Wisdom, but everybody's taken it seriously. Uh, so I really respect the contribution that you've made. Um, I like the story of where the choice comes from. Uh, and you are in a, an in-between space now. And I think when I first saw you the other night, I thought, this looks like a guy who just got divorced. Right? There's, there's a lot of energy, a lot of options. You're not sure. You're still connected. You're still grieving. What's the next thing? All that space. Very rich. Right? So I would say lean into that as much as you can. Um, allow yourself emotionally to be as, as open and as undecided and as in between as this affords you. Um, let that become its own kind of coherence. And uh, I mean, Zach and I came in together from the Wild Vessel camp. And we had a lot of discussion about decision-making, right? And in decision-making, if you do it right, if you're pondering, right, and you're going back and forth between things, and you are operating between these different systems in yourself that are leaning in different ways, and most people don't intentionally put the time in to wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. But if you spend that time going back and forth, weighing it, analyzing it with different parts of your being, those bits touch each other more and more across that liminal gap. And then when they click in, then you go, oh, that feels great. I'm more organized, and I've made a decision. There's no possible way I could get outside myself and objectively know, but I know it is my decision now. I've made it. This is what I'm going to do. And that's tremendously liberating, and it gives you a kind of buzz, which all good meditation should give you, because it's brought many parts of yourselves together, and they've become a better team.
Yeah, and it's it's interesting because what you're talking about, kind of the subconscious or the the non the non rational, is something I'm feeling quite viscerally at the moment because I can rationally believe that whatever comes next will be that something will 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 come along that it will be an expansion rather than a contraction of of moving on from rebel wisdom. But at the same time, my my body and my emotions are not necessarily feeling that, and are really feeling the visceral nature of like well. What the fuck? How am I gonna? How am I gonna survive? How am I gonna get my my kind of, um, yeah, kind of living needs met? All of these different things, and um, and that's a really interesting place to be, uh, and it does feel like a kind of death process in a in a lot of ways. Um, so in, in a way, it doesn't matter how many times how how much I kind of think from from a kind of rational place that it's it's going to be fine, it's going to unfold. It it really feels like a kind of leap into the unknown in that way. The processing will take as long as it takes, but uh, you know, l- learning to be more graceful at grieving is something we all need to do, right? In order to um, bring the rest of our system along with us, and as a species, we haven't been doing that very well, right? As a Western modern civilization, we've been doing it very poorly. And as we stand in front of your situation, echoes the larger situation. Right, we're all moving on from feeling like this civilization has been working, <laughs> and we don't know what's going to come. And if we're emotionally caught up in in the situation, if we haven't grieved our way through it, if we haven't allowed ourselves to be worried and disappointed and uncertain, then we're not going to be we're not going to be showing up to the point where we might be able to play a part in the solution. I don't even want to call it the solution, but in order to figure out how we go forward with coherence, we have to let it take the time it takes and let our hearts break as much as they want to break and also build skill at that because there's going to be so many reasons to descend and drop and break and grieve and our energy has to be able to go all the way down if it's going to come back up. Yeah, and there's something about attuning to that. Um, in I mentioned in February the, the breath work and it was one of the most intensely visceral feelings of kind of just learning to tune that kind of sense of alignment inside and, and become more and more familiar with it and kind of using emotions and using the felt sense as a as a kind of compass and that moment of kind of dropping in of like oh it's actually maybe time to let go of this and letting go of the energetic connection and attachment to the project felt like a real it's the most intensely visceral shift i've ever experienced in a way of like oh and then a lot of creativity unblocked a lot of kind of freedom came from that um and learning to kind of navigate. Um, you're familiar with the, in- the inquiry work and the, the diamond diamond essence work. Like that would be one one another dialogos in John Vivaki's terms. I think is another like essential skill to start to attune to that thing that wants to emerge in ourselves and in the space between us. And that's essentially a non-rational process as well. Yeah, the conscious mind's there, but it's only one of the participants. Um, inquiry is great. Uh, I would say keep an eye open for unexpected opportunities. Say yes to things that surprise you during the transition. Uh, if there's little bits of ritual or deal opportunities that you come across, take those. But also, I mean, you're talking to me, you're talking to Greg, but um, spend as much time with your elders as you can, whoever you consider them to really be. That's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, because, you know, what does this field become? How do we instantiate it more? It's going to have to have some of the characteristics of a tribe. It calls itself a tribe or a collection of tribes all the time, but it's not really doing the necessary things a tribe does. And one of the things a tribe does is it polarizes this relationship between people and their elders. And the elders, I've been talking to the older people here, and they don't necessarily want to think of themselves as elders, right? And they're not that old and they're vital and they're ongoing. And that's why we want to consider them elders because they are still lively. But they've seen these things move through a lot of layers and they hold a space that is the space we're going toward. And when we venerate them as elders, we set ourselves on a path to be the elders we might become. And it creates this possibility of movement and flow through in the community. So whenever you have a chance to talk to anybody who's been doing this longer than you, do what you're doing right now. Ask for hints. Even if they tell you something that's meaningless, what they transmit to you underneath that might be important, might be a nutrient you need. And what have you got coming up that you're excited about? 
Hi, I'm uh, Bruce and I are working on a book to put together the prepositional grammar theology with the metaphysics of adjacency. There'll be lots more integral stage to come. We're going to do a second course uh, with Parallax online. I'm going to focus more on how you turn the, the connection-oriented network society into a real set of internal practices, how you make a living spirituality out of that world. Uh, Brandon and I might be putting a second Metamodern Spirituality Retreat on in Vermont in October. We're in negotiations about that right now. Uh, I'm going up tonight to Ontario to uh, have the first in-person meeting of the Ontario Depth Adaptation Group. We don't know how, how many people will actually be able to show up, but we really want to put bioregional thinking at the forefront of everybody's mind here. The sort of, I call it amphibious apocalyptarianism. All right, the world is in some kind of apocalyptic mood. There's these ongoing trends we have to prepare for. We don't know when a disruption is going to come or what kind it will be, but something is coming, and yet you have to build for a world that's stable as well. Now that's the amphibious part. You've got to build for both. But I think we all need to know, you know, where's our power going to come from? Where's our food going to come from? Who do we want in our bunkers, so to speak? How do the best people we know be the people that we favor and privilege in, in like real support, real networks, and real survival opportunities. And that has to be done not just in the international, global, digital environment. It has to be done in bioregions. You don't know how the unique needs of an area are going to get met unless the people who have to live in that area come together, know where each other are, and try to put that at the forefront of their thinking. Is there anything that we didn't touch that you wanted to finish off with? Mm -hmm. I just want to say I love you. <laughs> you know, uh, every interaction with you uh, is a pleasure. Uh, I like the journey you're on. I like the things you're interested in. And it's, uh, it's happier and more comfortable each time we interact, I think. I love the work you've been doing, man. Yeah, and I wanted to return that compliment. I've really, yeah, there's, there's a vibrancy and a groundedness in a world of kind of slightly kind of disconnected galaxy brains, I get a sense of a guy who's really fully um, embodied and is exploring all those different aspects and yeah, bringing together, like in, integral shouldn't mean kind of disembodied eggheads masquerading as Jedi as <laughs> in Jamie Wheel's inimitable phrase. Um, yeah, and there's a real groundedness and humanity and um, wholeness to you that I really appreciate. Well, it's nice to hear, thank you.